Uh, we have four wonderful panelists, like I mentioned. So before we get started, I will introduce our first speaker. This is Jacob Kramer Duffield, PhD. He is a data and audience consultant and a researcher. He's worked for nearly a decade in media analytics, pioneering podcast audio and audience measurement, and thinking about how systems in the space are evolving. His background is as a researcher in digital identities and understanding how increased usage of new communications technologies change how we conceive ourselves and relate to each other. He'll be chatting with us today about the growing political economy of podcasting. Hi, um, and thanks for coming to this talk. Um, what I hope to open today is a conversation about podcasting that isn't based mostly around jokes around food delivery services, mattress websites, or easy one-liners about the ubiquity of podcasts and the unsufferability of their hosts. That is a different talk. Uh, what I hope to accomplish today is to start thinking about the history and structures of the medium, uh, technologies, institutions, and people, and how they have gotten us to this moment. The kinds of voices that we hear, the kinds of work that is performed, and the parties who profit or are sustained by these acts are all the product of a very specific political economy and it's worth examining with a critical eye. Podcasting is an unusual communicative medium in several ways. Um, like radio or television, it was in fact invented at a particular time and place. But unlike them, it was not a big technical breakthrough, but rather a simple technical change in an open web standard. Uh, a few lines of code, in other words. The RSS .92 standard was released on December in December of 2000. And unlike the previous RSS standards, it allowed for the inclusion of media files. That's it. That's podcasting. Um, there's a very interesting and weird story to be told about the early days of podcasting, but again, that's a different talk. What's important for our purposes is as much about what the RSS standard doesn't include as what it does. Uh, on the host end of things, uh, people serving the files um, and setting up the feed, um, there's very little information about the client that's transmitted. The most useful are the IP address and user agent for sort of identifying and maintaining uh, identity at a moment, but not really over time, because IP address shift and people use different software over time. Um, and the user agent describes the software being used to download the file, whether it's the Apple Podcast app or Mozilla or a Wi-Fi connected dishwasher or whatever. Um, but to the consternation of some of the podcast business, and certainly many in the advertising business, this is not remotely on the level of the personally identifiable information that we all give and have long been giving um, with every website we visit, every app we download. Because most podcast producers host their own files or outsource to a few services like Libsyn, uh, we do not otherwise have user profiles of their listeners. There is far more about users that they don't know, that we don't know, uh, than that we do. Important caveat about Apple. Uh, due to the early embrace of podcasting by the iTunes Music Store um, and the adoption of the iPod, Apple gained the initial dominance of the podcast listenership. And it's still a majority, though that's decreasing every year. Um, and while pod Apple doesn't know your podcast listening habits through RSS, they do know through the podcast app and iTunes tied to your larger Apple profile they, uh, the information you give them as a matter of commerce and for sustaining that Apple universe profile. Um, but for the most part, they're not telling us, either the public or podcast producers, what they know. Uh, they started sharing anonymized analytics on this behavior on their platform at the end of last year, but do not at present specifically monetize podcasts themselves for now. And that most assuredly is another talk. So given that podcasting was at the same time as the web got creepier and creepier and web video tried, kept trying to happen and eventually did, um, a medium that was not vulnerable to automated monetization, who would choose to invest resources? The answer is threefold. Uh, one, first, some early startup money that tried to figure out the space in the early 2000s. Uh, long story short, they really didn't. And there's some interesting cultural artifacts that are of a product of those efforts, but for the most part, it did not have a huge impact on what 
podcasting is as we know it today. Um, hobbyists and those with passion projects, and that does have a lot to say about um, about parts of what the podcasting ecosystem have become. Um, but then, of course, public media. And, uh, and that's what I'm going to focus most of my attention on, just because that accounted for the largest uh, influx of listeners and the most early uh, investment in the medium. For public media sta radio stations and for public media generally, the value proposition was clear. Uh, while their audience was previously limited to the people within range of the radio transmitter, while a particular program was being broadcast, and public media tends not to have exceptionally powerful radio transmitters, um, it was now possible for anyone, at any time, anywhere, to listen to their shows. And since the shows were already paid for by a combination of member support, underwriting, which is the weird pseudo ads on public media that they're limited in what kinds of claims and statements they can make, that's a whole thing, um, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, um, and while bandwidth wasn't free early, each new listener was more a marginal benefit to a mission-driven organization. They got people listening. And of course, those new listeners were also potential new members or contributors. The origin story of podcasting is thus one that highly privileged the worldview and tastes of a demographic you're liable to hear mostly described in Republican attack ads of the 1990s. Upper middle class, Volvo driving, Apple computer owning, NPR listening, overeducated white coastal liberals. Um, and uh, I, I didn't have a 240, I had a 760 in high school. Um, this does, however, turn out to matter quite a bit. In the early pre-serial days, indeed this explains the whole reason why serial existed, the biggest hit podcasts were, with a few exceptions, the biggest shows on public radio. Because of the discussed ambiguous analytics, monetization lagged behind. But when it arrived, it was not insubstantial. Uh, even given the limitations of underwriting and the CPMs you can drive from that, rather than advertising, shows like This American Life, with broadcast audiences in the millions, and digital audiences also in the lower millions, were able to substantially alter their fortunes. Uh, and thus was This American Life um, able to spin itself off from its original member station into an independent organization and finance the development of Serial um, and further define the very question of what a podcast can sound like. What a podcast sounds like and also what a podcast looks like. For a large share of earlier listeners, what a podcast sounded like was Ira Glass, or Jad Abramrod, or Robert Prolwich, or Terry Gross, or Stephen Dubner. What it sounded like was very much what the audience looked like. Well-educated, upper middle class, mostly white, mostly men. But these were the not the only people who make podcasts. Uh, while it has done a poor job of hiring and promoting people of color within its ranks, public media, more than many other media, has long had a over, oh, more representative share of women on staff mostly not behind the mic. Women have excelled as producers and administrators for years, but with the exception of Terry Gross, very few had become hosts until very recently. This led to two main trends, bias, unconscious and not, over how and to whom podcasts are marketed, and grave imbalances in the distribution of compensation and workload. To cut right to the chase, women in public media and podcasting more broadly have long carried a disproportionate share of making male hosts sound good and have, for, for their troubles, been dramatically underpaid relative even to their male colleagues with the same titles, excluded from the host chair, and, of course, sexually harassed for their efforts. And while these are the most prominent examples of the men in public media and podcast space thus far called to some account for their actions, it's a small share of the senior men in the space who have long treated women, producers, who make their shows as something like a constantly refreshed pool of available dates and or exploitable labor. Suffice to say, the arrival of venture funding to back new podcasting startups and to subsidize the medium through venture-funded startups has not diminished this gender or power imbalance. But the arrival of larger economic movers has also created other spaces. Traditionally excluded voices, writers and hosts with non-public media backgrounds, new formats and approaches to storytelling, and alternate methods of financing, whether it be crowdfunding, creator-owned networks, public benefit corporations, 
have risen just, has risen just as the now archetypal voices in podcasting have prospered. These point to alternate models of how this medium can work with high audience engagement among, uh, among them, leading to a viability threshold, so the sort of size of audience that's necessary to sustain an endeavor, um, that's substantially below, below other broadcast media. There's also another pressure, uh, the gradual move to streaming. With each year, broadcasts, broadband signals improve and more listeners are hearing podcasts, not in the old download and listen later model, which was established with the initial use of iPods and other MP3 players as the default method, and then not, they're not really being effective wireless for a lot of people, um, but, uh, but through streaming, um, which technical protocol allows for tracking just as thorough and creepy as anything else on the web or in apps. And as more money floods in along with new users never habituated to life within iPod, the pressure will only increase at the cost of user pr uh, privacy. And so I'd like to propose an approach for thinking about the political economy of podcasting. There are four major factors to consider. First, audience. We need to consider who the audio was made for in addition to who is listening to it. Second, production and representation. What is the process by which the audio was made? And who is being represented? I mean representation here in several senses. Uh, most obviously, whose voices are literally being heard as the hosts, reporters, and producers. But also, whose views and perspectives are being represented in the overall editorial output and mission, the kinds of stories that are getting told. And finally, who is being represented as having done the work? Are there hosts on a pedestal with producers and engineers listed in the credits? Or is the effort framed as a collaboration? Uh, third, there's the issue of distribution and consumption. How is audio being sent out to listeners? What formats and contacts is it, is it being consumed? This can include issues of exclusive windowing on various platforms, as both Apple and Spotify have done, total platform independence and agnosticism, unplatforming, as in the case of some Patreon funded shows. And while analytics can get at part of the consumption question, this point also contains the mysterious last mile question just how are podcasts listened to? We still know comparatively little. Finally, there's the, issue, there's the question of monetization, which informs and interacts with all the above points. Ad-funded shows have to quantify and sell their audiences, which has the effect of reinforcing a search for the kinds of upper middle class audiences we've discussed. Venture-funded shows and studios have a pressure to follow not only on these valuable audiences, but also on massive scale, which dictates the kinds of stories they can, can't, will, or won't tell. Distribution medium can add the further veto point of much larger, better financed, platform companies into the equation, which again can constrain what stories are told. And of course, compensation, which follows both the status quo ante of imbalance between hosts and producers and gender imbalances, and which dictates the kinds of stories that shows can tell and what they can't. These questions are just the beginning, and I hope you'll come away from this talk with a more critical eye to this emerging medium and be motivated to incorporate it as a distinct and interesting part of the media spectrum in your own inquiries. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Margot Hanley. She will be presenting Alexa, Please. I feel like I should say that Alexa, Please. I don't know. There's, yeah. <laughs> uh, this, her talk is on emerging interaction rules between people and voice assistants. Margot is a qualitative researcher finishing up her master's degree in sociology at Columbia University. She's interested in the social dimensions of human to robot interactions. She'll be discussing with us her current research, focusing on voice assistants and the emergent interaction rules between them and humans. After graduating, she's heading over to Cornell Tech, where she will be studying the spillover effects of robot to human interactions. Last but not least, she moonlights as a procurement artist. It's pretty cool. This is Margot. Thank you. Um, take this off. Um, hi, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Margot Hanley. Like Joelle said, I'm a master's student at Columbia, um, finishing up this spring, but I'm going to be continuing this research through the summer. Um, so you're catching me a little bit uh, in, in the midst of a work in progress, as you can see by the title change as well. Um, but yeah, today I'm going to be talking about um, 
this kind of um, emergent interaction that we're having. And I say emergent, uh, you know, voice uh, interface has been around for a very long time, but I say emergent because of the scale at which they're kind of um, ex existing in, in our homes, in the public discourse, et cetera. Um, so, um, yeah, I think uh, more broadly, I'm really interested in the, the social implications of of technology, of, of emerging technology. And um, this one particularly interesting um, to me because uh, human computer interface and human robot interface, these, these disciplines I think do a really fine job of, of, of talking about interactions and interactions with technology, but sociology uh, does not. And um, certainly there are some theorists in the field that are talking about it, but um, I think that it's really important that there's a social lens and a social perspective on these interactions that are just uh, proliferating there. Um, as you can see, as everyone knows, I think uh, voice assistants are, um, are, are, are are coming into all of our, our homes, <laughs> our, our friends' homes, probably everyone here, um, or potentially has interacted with one or has stories about interacting with them. Um, you know, 25 million sold in 2017. Uh, from 1.7 to 2015 when uh, the Echo was kind of introduced. And so they're growing so rapidly. Um, and with it, uh, you know, kind of a, a f we're hearing what a, a frenzy of weird stories of, um, a, a, of, of questions, kind of how do we, um, is that I have five left? Oh, okay, cool, sorry, it's like, what? Um, uh, Kind of with it, um, you know, these weird questions like, um, uh, you know, what, why do they all have um, feminine or female voices? Are my kids going to stop saying please and thank you? Am I going to stop saying please and thank you? What is the point of please and thank you? You know, and like these weird, introspective, dark moments um, where you're kind of questioning um, phatic interactions, right? The kind of like, uh, a small talk that we that we have to go on through the day, and kind of all the things we do in normal human interactions, and kind of how they're mapping onto these interactions with these devices. So, super interesting space to me, um, and uh, and yeah. So I kind of I went into the field um, using kind of a, a grounded theory approach, which means I had no particular research question um, in true qualitative researcher sociologist fashion. Um, I, I went in um, not deductively in the slightest, kind of just um, interested in kind of what themes and, and patterns are emerging. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the, um, the, the, the methods and kind of the data, just because I think that's important, and then tell you some kind of, um, uh, some, some of the findings uh, that I'm seeing. Um, not as well organized, I don't think, uh, but but super interesting and like I said, a work in progress. So um, yeah, so I went into the field kind of in, in the wild in device owners' homes. So doing ethnographic interviews, kind of um, sitting with owners of these devices and talking to them about their experience with the devices as well as um, interacting with the device. Of course, the device would just kind of barge in, like for instance, like an Alexa would just kind of like hear its name and then just kind of like jump in and say, I don't understand that, which obviously would like produce an amazing rich litany of follow-up questions for me as an interviewer. So um, <laughs> very fun. Um, I only was able to uh, uh, interview people with Echoes and Google Assistants. Um, I didn't interview any with Cortanas because <laughs> That was hard to find. And similarly, HomePod. Um, yeah. Uh, so we'll see about that. Um, and then, uh, but yeah, 16 device owners, a few couples in there. And four of those were um, individuals in their mid 90s, so at a retirement home in Southern California. Um, who are obviously self-selected, very tech-savvy individuals, but um, also own devices and had a lot to say. And then device producers. So. Um, on you know on, on on the flip side of this in a face to face social interaction, um, one of these things is a voice assistant that is a, a combination of uh, you know is an assemblage really of values and ethics and perspectives and backgrounds of 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 you know thousands and thousands of, of people, including you know engineers are what most people think about, but it's script writers who are writing the answer to what Alexa or Siri says when you say, I'm sad, you know, and they have to make these decisions. Um, script writers, uh, evangelists who are going around training new engineers to think about voice user interfaces, this whole weird world on the back end of these devices. So um, 
went out to the West Coast, uh, interviewed 11 of those people um, to get this kind of high-level perspective of what's going on, not only with the interactions themselves, but what's informing, um, I won't say mind, but, uh, you know, the, the, the this this social actor, what, what is informing what's, what's, what's coming out of its speaker. Um, Theoretically, uh, grounded theory is is great. Um, you know, kind of gives you a lot of flexibility. But similarly, you want to go in in the field with some kind of sociological theoretical guardrails. Um, symbolic interactionism is really interesting uh, branch of micro sociology, which mainly focuses on how to understand society um, at you know at the really small scale. So, how do we understand? Um, our institutions, our norms, how they're being produced and reproduced in face-to-face -face interactions, in small group interactions, um, paired very nicely with the, the, <laughs> the research that I want to do here. Um, founded uh, really more by social psychologists uh, and then uh, formalized by Bloomer and Irving Goffman, as someone people might know, who did kind of fun dramaturgical interpretations of um, uh, interactions as performances, putting on our masks and, and things. Um, so really interesting, rich field. Um, three main tenets here, kind of uh, all around meaning and how meaning is brought to interactions, how it's created through interactions, and how it changes um, through interactions. So obviously, in this case, I was kind of going into the field thinking, um, this is, uh, you know, a, a voice assistant, and Alexa is familiar to us through its voice interface, um, through its, it speaks language, it's a, um, language is, you know, a collection of symbols with which we talk to other humans with, um, but it's not human. And so kind of how are people um, assimilating this thing into their lives, into their homes, into their private spaces? Um, and then, of course, how meanings are made through interactions and then um, how that's changing. So that's the main theoretical perspective. At the great chagrin of my socio sociology department, I also included some work by Clifford Nass, um, who's not a sociologist, and of course, disciplines hate that. Um, and he did some really awesome stuff. Uh, probably don't have much time to, to dig into it um, here, but um, uh, positioning uh, computers as social actors. Um, so like I said, in sociology, that's still kind of a, it's still in flux. Um, Bruno Latour does some really cool stuff talking about non-humans, and, and there are some others as well. But um, but Clifford Nass, uh, not necessarily a sociologist, just communication professor at Stanford, talked a lot about this, did some really amazing exper uh, experiments proving that people um, will engage with the computer in a social way, will kind of um, uh, mindlessly apply these like human uh, heuristics when a, a computer has some social or, uh, or human cue to it. So in this case, like a voice output will make people, um, you know, uh, kind of use gender stereotypes. Or in some cases, um, this photo is from an article, uh, is, is like um, sweet talking your computer, where people wouldn't want to hurt their computer's feelings. And so they would go out of their way to like, you know, to rate a computer poorly. Um, like not in front of it or something, you know, like these kind of experiments. So it's super amazing. And of course, this was in the 80s or something. And so now, you know, with, with these voice assistants, it's just more and more sophisticated. Um, they're responsive. They're talking to us. Um, you know, they're responding directly to things we say, et cetera. And so um, it's even more pronounced impacts like this. And I'm seeing it a lot in my data. Um, and so this is Clementine, one of the women I was telling you about um, at this retirement home. Uh, she says, and it oddly enough, that pleasant female voice that they've endowed Alexa with, it becomes familiar and friendly, and you kind of look forward to hear it. I always say good morning to her, and she tells me a rotten joke in return. Um, which was funny, because I interviewed someone who writes these jokes, and they were like, rewrite these amazing jokes that everyone loves. And I was like, oh, this is awkward. Um, so, but so, so yeah, so um, a lot of interesting things here, right? Pleasant female voice is kind of fits into this narrative, this big, huge question, right, of like gender and why do these things have female voices and what is the impact of that? And, um, you know, there, there are meaningful impacts of that interface, um, of it being a voice assistant, right, um, in, in, in a social hierarchy, of it having a female voice and playing into these stereotypes, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But, um, you know, you kind of see uh, it working really effectively. And the companies are aware of this. They're aware of female voices being very effective. They're aware of um, making subservient 
uh, making these devices subservient, being really effective, and that's how they're being designed, and um, and it works. Um, cool. So, um, so it's it's clear that people people are saying she, people are saying her, people are anthropomorphizing it, people are. Um, you know, companionship, like I just showed you with that woman Clementine, is one way in which people are um, endeared to the device. There's other ones, some kind of weird, you know, like um, people will, you know, one one guy interview talked about kind of how he was trying to be like, kind of like make sexual jokes with it. It wasn't like being like sexual enough and it was like putting him in a bad mood or something, right? So people are, are trying to get something out of these devices, um, often in, in curious ways. Um, but anyways, I, I kind of wanted to see if the she and the her, um, the, the pronoun stuff, um, the, the, the basic high-level anthropomorphism went any deeper. So I used, um, so I'm kind of talking today a little bit about this uh, um, kind of re research methodological trick tool called breaching exercises. I don't know if anyone knows anything about this. It's like intentionally subverting a social norm to, um, to, to make everyone uncomfortable, to make someone uncomfortable, um, and then to learn something from that discomfort, right? And to learn kind of what the contour of that boundary is and why it is there. And um, and so, yeah, kind of developed by Harvard, uh, Harold Garfinkel, ethnomethodologist, which is a, 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 a sibling with symbolic interactionism. Oh, and uh, obviously they're um, mortifying and super embarrassing, um, and I and I was doing them, and I um, sat down with like the nicest woman, like self like self identified Midwesterner, super polite. It's like the end of our interview, we had this like really nice like rapport, and I was like feeling all good, and then I go, do you mind if I? And I kind of gesture towards the device, and she's like, sure, sure, and I go. Alexa, fuck you. And she blanches. She just like stares at me and she blanches. And I go, and it was so uncomfortable, right? Which meant it was a very successful breaching exercise. And um, I go, oh, like, why, why are you feeling so uncomfortable right now? Um, she goes, I feel surprised. I was surprised you said that. It's so weird to say this. I think it just makes me think negative feelings about you. Like I wouldn't want to be friends with someone who's mean to the wait staff. Um, yeah. And then more of these, right? So here's a guy I did the exact same thing with. He and I kept in all the ums and nos and the things, because. But um, you guys should just read it. It's uncomfortable to read. Also, I stutter so much. But so what you kind of see like emerging. There's more and more and more of these, right? Is that people. Um, and what I, you know, this is a voice and sound, <laughs> a sound panel. So I'm kind of trying to tie, tie back that, but that. Um, that well through this breaching exercise, I'll, I'll let everyone keep reading it. Um, it, it kind of exposing some of these latent, um, you know, orientations that people have to the device, and um, and 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 based on kind of a lot of the same social dimensions, and you know, around um, race and gender and ability. Not race as much in my sample. I'm sure if I expanded the sample, which I want to do, I would see that. But certainly, what I'm seeing is gender and status or gender and ability. Um, that, that people are really, I mean, in very concrete ways, um, you know, uh, relating kind of um, this, you know, this 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 mapping um, of, uh, of of really things that we're seeing that we see play out day to day in, in in human interactions and kind of at a you know at a huge at a at a societal level. Um, so yeah, so it kind of became a lever. Um, you can see over here on the right. Um, that it's it's not such a surprise, right? That that people feel this way, and that people are um, characterizing the devices in this way, and and developing um, expectations and assumptions of these devices in this way from like from gender and ability, um, which I don't have as much in the data here, but uh, didn't have the time. But like here's Google's, you know, most recent came out like a month ago. Um, advertising campaign, make Google do it. So it has a female voice, and it's in your home, and it doesn't have a female name, but you're interacting with it. You know, um, one of the 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 men I interviewed named Pierce, he said it about the device. He objectified it every single time until it, the device kind of jumped into the conversation, said something, and then the next sentence he said she or her, because you know right after you hear it, I mean, it's priming you to think, you know, to to. With with this kind of social cue, um, and it's a really micro level analysis, but but really you know it, it's it's playing out, and so this kind of emerging status relation develop. It's not a surprise, um, and yeah. To add a quick note, like uh, companies, if you'll see every single one of their websites is 
um, it refers to these devices with with a with a neuter pronoun, uh, third person pronoun. It's it or it's the name Alexa or Google Assistant, and then. And, and then like, no one else does, you know, like all of the owners, all of the producers are saying she, and this is what's, excuse me, getting, getting built into, um, interactions, um, sum up to try to tie it up, you know, a little bit more concretely to what we're talking about today. The voice interface is a really powerful tool. Um, and it's, it, it's not only reflecting and mirroring kind of, um, you know, the, the social issues that we're experiencing day to day, um, but also, um, in, in some respects, reproducing them in a new way with with, with these devices. Um, and so here's a quote from that guy Pierce. I like the female voice better in general. I don't know why. It's just, I feel like all the movies, how I imagine AI's voice, I don't have a good reason for it. So, you know, uh, this is a, a young white man, right, who wants a female voice. These are people that end up like, you know, like buying these. These are kind of what's feeding into the data these companies are using to design these. Not to say it's all the companies you know, the, it, it's all in the companies. But just to say that these kind of, um, you know, uh, the, these kind of dynamics end up getting fed in. There's like a really strong feedback loop, um, literally reproducing kind of how, how we're interacting with these devices and, um, and, and the social norms that are and will be. So thank you so much, everyone. I think I'm at time um, and yeah. Rob is a writer and editor uh, living between Brooklyn and Durham, North Carolina. Within the arts, his work deals with immaterial labor, platform precarity, and the many ongoing frictions between digital platforms and the cultural production they now sustain, both online and off. He's written for Spin, Pitchfork, Noisy, The Outline, and Real Life, and is currently a graduate student at Duke University. He's excited to combine many parts of his life into a talk on algorithms, data, and aesthetics. Please welcome Rob. Should I just kind of speak loudly too, I guess? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm Rob Arcan. I, uh, I'm a journalist. I'm finishing my master's at Duke. Um, and I work at Spin Magazine uh, doing the news on the weekends. And uh, my work really focuses on uh, the relationship between digital platforms and cultural production. And uh, there we go. I was just <laughs> uh, Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, my work is on the relationship between digital platforms and cultural production and how our understanding of culture might be changing in the hands of monopolistic platforms and their practices. Um, so today, you know, I really want to talk about data, specifically the ways in which data has become a new vehicle for the expansion of capitalism, uh, fueling a variety of platforms who've built entire business models around finding new ways to extract more and more value from cultural spaces. Um, you know, most recently, if we think of something like Facebook, especially, you know, Cambridge Analytica and all that, it's, it's pretty clear that algorithms and the data that animate them um, is opening up new spheres of power and influence that, you know, beyond being very valuable in the advertising world, fundamentally change our relationship to things like uh, music and culture and, and culture more broadly. Um, so uh, while they largely come from quantifiable positivistic origins in computer science, engineering, and the runaway financial world, frequently tied to um, you know, uh, the tech world, uh, algorithms are deeply cultural objects. Following the work of folks like Ed Finn and Terrell St. Gillespie at Cornell, I want to argue that um, the interface layer of platforms uh, across the board has socio-political valence through aesthetics of inclusion and exclusion using now fairly common data valence practices to monitor and quantify lived experience through tools on the platform. Um, for folks like Ed Finn or Nick Siever, algorithms represent a pretty broad category of uh, computational processes, and it seems pretty important uh, to specify exactly what we're talking about in this space. Um, in his book, What Algorithms Want, you know, Finn draws a distinction between a pragmatic and cultural definition of the algorithm as both aspects increasingly weave their way into everyday life. Um, drawing on the work of in Catherine Hales at Duke, um, Finn notes that there's a the, pragmatic, the pragmatist definition grounds its truth claim in utility. Algorithms are fit for a purpose, illuminating pathways between problems and solutions related to what Hales calls a, a hard claim for computationalism. Um, building on Hales' writing, uh, Finn suggests that there's a guiding logic behind the thought that all human processes can be reduced, and effectively, or reduced to quantification and effectively streamlined by algorithmic means. Yet as algorithms move deeper and deeper into cultural space, um, you know, as many already realize, a whole spectrum for social and anthropological observation opens up in this gap between cultural and technical definitions. Um, and uh, again, uh, it seems 
like a simple, simple observation, but the interface layer you interact with on your computer, on your mobile phone, um, et cetera, that represents the culmination of everything, uh, collecting data, data under an illusion of platform utility, but also masking the labor of designers, of content moderators, of advertising experts, et cetera, under the guise of a seamless user experience, and you know, pretty frequently at the direct expense of privacy. Um, this abstraction of labor feels intensified in cultural spaces, specifically through the introduction of recommendation engines, which um, use algorithms grounded in this accumulation of data to produce an ever-changing network of taste profiles, fundamentally changing our relationship to things like taste, criticism, culture, and others, um, all while masking the influence of cultural actors in this algorithmic space. Um, so to tie it back to uh, music specifically, which is you know my focus as a journalist and um, as a grad student, uh, I think it's helpful to give a bit of a historical overview on one company that's been you know, incredibly successful using data to reshape the foundation of music culture, and that's uh, Spotify. So back in 2006, Spotify grew out of a new entanglement between business and the totalizing digital archive. You know, as many probably already know, uh, the early 2000s saw companies like Napster, LimeWire, Pirate Bay, and others uh, building new wildly popular tools that enabled uh, widespread music piracy, practically upheaving the record industry and its model for music as a saleable digital commodity iTunes and others um, were able to negotiate you know, pretty unprecedented deals at the time uh, with record labels. Um, the record industry, of course, still saw a huge decline in revenue. Um, and as, a, as an outsider, Spotify grew out of this specific moment of opportunism, seeking to translate the seamless experience of uh, unlimited access through piracy um, to a new low-cost subscription-based and ad-supported model, untethering digital audio from the MP3 ownership model um, of the digital marketplace um, Spotify instead established a, a new model built around the playlist as a finite cultural object. Um, and branded playlists, of course, have been central to uh, the company's founding um, and really took off in the 2010s uh, with well-known playlists like Rap Caviar, Undercurrents, Discover Weekly, and others, of course, becoming central to their image as a finely tuned playlist machine. Um, but none of this would really be possible without uh, help from a, a little data science team known as the Echo Nest. Um, so, in its early days, Spotify acquired data from a company called the Echo Nest um, that was founded in 2005 by um, a few PhD students at the MIT Media Lab. Um, the Echo Nest sought to automate musical classification through two primary methods. Um, those of uh, computer audition or machine listening classification, which uh, captured the sonic, acoustic qualities um, of things like timbre, structure, duration, pitch, etc., embedded within like the MP3 as a, a finite cultural product, um, and, and those of cultural context on, on music sites, on blogs, and, and other means of, of like cultural conversation online. Um, uh, so in contrast you know, to something like Pandora, whose, whose music genome project has long since stressed the humanistic side of classification, um, for a while they hired PhD musicology students, and they were sort of tasked with determining um, the sort of musical, musical logical uh, classifications of things like the gender of the lead vocalist, the, the tempo of the chorus, the level of distortion on guitars, and sort of reducing that to a 36-page a um, system of classification. Um, the Echo Nest instead attempted to automate this process, um, building highly semantic profiles of audio culture based entirely around collected data. Um, as Robert Prey writes in his essay, Nothing personal, algorithmic individuation on streaming platforms. Um, to this end, the Echo Nest developed a preference analytic and visualization tool called the Taste Profile. Every interaction a listener has with a musical item, including things like uh, the musicers, uh, music, listeners' taste, um, artists, songs, favorites, ratings, skips, uh, bands, etc., is captured and recorded in real time. Um, so, to kind of give you a glimpse of just a small portion of the data that they collect, um, I went on the Spotify web API and just scraped a slight amount um, for the song Hey Jude by the Beatles. Um, this is sort of what they call the upper level audio analysis, which is things like key, tempo, um, loudness, energy, danceability, acousticness. Um, these features are unique to the Spotify platform and are quantified on a scale between zero and one. Um, you know, and, and this is like uh, time-based analysis, so you have, uh, it, it structures, it, it attempts to like map things in terms of um, like what we would traditionally associate with meter, uh, bars, and measures, and in kind of these musicological terms, but often it's pretty inaccurate and a bad um, metric for these things. But So where before, you know, big data, these qual uh, quantifications like uh, danceability, acousticness, liveness, and others, um, 
maybe once represented uh, one's subjective interpretation of, of a song, whether you think it's very danceable or whatever. Um, their place on Spotify is yet another attempt to quantify taste, extracting latent value from the MP3, once limited to the realm of aesthetic interpretation, into the platform by design. Um, and it also feels worth mentioning specifically that um, this is built on the back of an advertising engine. Spotify has, of course, you know, since its early days, pursued sponsored playlists with a variety of companies in the interest of creating experiences. Um, in 2016, uh, Spotify's global creative director, Rick Frankel, uh, points to the ongoing collaborations with brands like Nike, Starbucks, BMW, as other, and others as ways of moving forward. Um, and just what does it mean to have something as, once as, as disparate as taste, um, reduced to quantification and danceability in the service of a liquor brand or a beer company or something. Uh, um, so it's, it's hard to talk about value without talking about the labor and workers behind it. And um, it's in this sense that I want to argue that the biggest challenge uh, for this algorithmic layer of streaming platforms, not just Spotify, but others, you know, Apple Music, SoundCloud, Tidal, YouTube, and, and in some cases Netflix might apply. Um, is to find new ways to attract more and more surplus value from new efficiencies present through music as a commodity. Uh, drawing on the work of folks like Christian Fuchs, uh, Catherine Hales, Michael Hart, um, and others, I see Spotify as a kind of cybernetic system designed to maximize the extraction of value, not only from the MP3 as a commodity, but um, also from this, uh, the vast amount of workers and creators behind its cultural context. Um, you know, as a journalist, our work every day is powering the kind of Spotify engine um, to produce cult the cultural context for music in their uh, system, and musicians especially are uh, losing a lot of, are, are just pouring labor and time and work into creating this kind of algorithmic system. Um, so it seems commonly understood that Spotify wants to keep listeners within this ecosystem. Uh, it, it points even going so far as to produce what they call algatorial uh, content to resituate music into a contextual system of their own design, uh, provided through a combination of algorithmic curation and what they're now doing um, with short form editorial content, which the name algatorial kind of implies. Um, uh, this move especially aligns with the guiding logic of cybernetic capitalism, which um, as the French collect writers collective Tikkun defined in their cybernetic hypothesis is an autonomous world of apparatuses so blended with the capitalist project that has become a political project. Um, elsewhere in the text they write, uh, the cybernetic gesture affirms itself in the negation of everything that escapes regulation. Um, for, for a lot of uh, people con critiquing um, neoliberalism and late capitalism, um, the neoliberal project was an attempt to extend privatization into public spaces or, common, or the commons once reserved for collective municipal use. Um, if we read music piracy as a kind of universal access at one point, uh, free from centralized ownership and intellectual property litigation, uh, we can interpret the ad-supported subscription-based models of Spotify and others um, as cybernetic extensions into the realm of cultural production. Um, but to return to Tikkun, the original rise of cybernetics in the wake of World War II mirrors the rise of neoliberal capitalism, instituting various methods to control the production of social groups um, for its own corporate use and industrial management. Um, they write, after uh, 1945, cybernetics supplied capitalism with a new infrastructure of machines, computers, um, and above all, with the intellectual technology that permitted the regulation of the circulation of flows within society, making those flows exclusively commodity flows. So if we think of um, the way commodities flow online and the way we are attempting to quantify everything with, it, with data, um, this mirrors the development of neoliberalism historically. Um, and so more to my point with streaming, I want to argue that at every point in the Spotify ecosystem, um, each layer necessary in the production of culture is now reduced to a, a cog in a system of cybernetic social control. Um, what once represented a diverse variety of scenes, subcultures, and communities online has now, through the reduction of music to data and further integration of these practices, reduced music culture and the image of cybernetic capitalized to maximize profit for Spotify and for their shareholders, um, now that they've gone public. Um, so. Even uh, more broadly than Spotify itself, uh, much of what's been made of new platform services in the gig economy more broadly is the ways in which they've used the convenience of mobile applications to tap into the latent value of ownership. Um, to return to Ed Finn's What Algorithms Want, he writes, uh, in terms of labor and surplus value, what the algorithms of Uber, Airbnb, and their cohorts capitalize on is the slack infrastructure of modern consumption, empty cars, unused homes, and underemployed people. Viewed more broadly, the interface layer 
as a colonization of the quiet backwaters of contemporary capitalism, the remobilization of goods and spaces after they have already been consumed or deployed. So I think um, it makes sense to extend this critique to the cognitive labor of content creation of all types. You know, whatever your status is on Spotify, SoundCloud, and other platforms, I think at each level, cultural workers are, are not only asked to break even financially themselves, but also forced into this weird, messy, ever-changing agreement with the platform to provide surplus value in exchange for just a simple place in the, on the platform. Um, so not only is this about surplus value, but it's also about uh, rent. Um, in this kind of capitalist sense. Uh, in his essay on Google's PageRank algorithm, Mate uh, Matteo Pasconelli suggests the notion of the extraction of rent to be a more efficient model for discussing the relations between platform platforms and content creators, rather than surplus value alone. Um, for creative industries especially, platform monopolies extract a cognitive rent as media corporations uh, s simply exploit the copyright of artworks that have virtually no cost in, in the reproduction. Um, in his reading, rent is a parasitic income, and owners can, uh, just by possessing an asset uh, or, or money, um, it, and Google specifically, which is his focus, um, Google uh, appears as pure rent on the meta dimension of information that is an accumulation uh, through the digital network. Um, so all of this is really to say that the data um, and the extraction of new value from works of art open up new spheres of power and influence that have huge implications for the music industry and culture more, more broadly. Um, Already we've seen, oh, already we've seen, uh, <laughs> supposed to be another slide there. Um, uh, already we've seen uh, third party playlist creators on, on places like Spotify um, trying to game the system and, and working out deals with record labels, um, places like uh, companies like Filter, which is now owned by Sony, Digster, which is now owned by Warner, Topsify, which is now owned by Universal. Um, these, these are, a, a way for firms to funnel resources normally gambled on branding, publicity, and others in the music industry toward more promising playlists in the Spotify ecosystem. Um, but you know, at the same time, this algorithmic layer hasn't been completely conquered, and I still think there's um, a few people working in this space who are particularly attuned to the politics of platforms. You know, um, to return to the cybernetic hypothesis, Takun suggests that there's um, there's a potential to like disrupt the cybernetic system, which um, I think in a lot of readings for people working with machine vision, they talk a lot about uh, using like. Oh, uh, I'm running out of time, but uh, yeah, this is all. This is to say that um, platforms are changing our relationship to music culture um, going forward, and this is a lot of my work going forward at Duke. But thank you. Um, lastly, we have Jack Webster. He'll be talking about taste in the digital age, how music, how are music streaming services shaping the relationship between taste, consumption, and class identity. Jack is a final year PhD student at the Web Science Center for Doctoral Training at the University of Southampton. Uh, Jack's research deals with issues relating to how digital platforms are shaping the production and consumption of culture. He also has experience working in the rec recorded music industry conducting research on behalf of major record labels. Please welcome Jack. OK, hello. Thanks for having me. Um, Rob's presentation has hopefully set mine up quite nicely, talking about streaming and collection like data and what this is doing to how we consume music. So that's really nice. Um, I'll get stuck into what I have to say. So music streaming services such as Spotify and Apple Music are transforming the way many of us access and consume music. Not only do these platforms facilitate access to vast catalogues of licensed music at little or no cost, but increasingly they are curating our encounters with it. These firms are gathering large volumes of very granular data about who we are and what we like to listen to, and combining this information with the latest advancements in machine learning technologies in order to shape what and how music is made available to us through the creation of playlists, recommendations, and other forms of curated content. These transformations invite us to consider if and how using music streaming services is disrupting the social dynamics of consumption. So let's do a quick survey. How many of you in the room use a music streaming service, such as Spotify, Apple Music? OK, so that's almost everybody. Uh, how many of you engage with the curated content they produce, so say Spotify's playlists or recommendations? OK, fewer. Uh, and how many of you feel like using these services has shaped your relationship with music in some way? OK, it's quite, quite a few of you. So it'll be interesting to reflect on how your experiences relate to the kind of things I'm going to speak about today. 
So in the 1960s, the influential sociologist Pierre Bourdieu demonstrated to us how cultural taste and consumption are implicated in the reproduction of class divisions. So Bourdieu would argue that what and how I consume music reveals to you information about my class background and distinguishes me as a member of the middle classes. In doing so, my taste distances me from members of the working or upper classes. Over time, sociologists have developed our understanding of the changing relationship between taste, consumption and class. For example, the mass production of culture occurring in the latter half of the 20th century has transformed the accessibility of culture, and the concept of the omnivore was introduced to acknowledge how class taste has incorporated cultural abundance. More recently, social sciences have speculated about if and how streaming services have the potential to disrupt the relationship between taste, consumption and class. For example, David Beer argues that in a context where culture now finds us, the cultivation of taste has the potential to become divorced from traditional socialization processes. Whilst David Wright argues that the use of recommendation technologies has the potential to reinforce divisions in class taste. However, little empirical research has been given, little empirical consideration has been given to the question of if and how using streaming services is shaping the relationship between taste, consumption, and class. So in response to this, I present findings from a qualitative study about how using Spotify is shaping how <coughs> class divisions are reproduced through the consumption of music. In particular, today I'm going to argue that the ways in which Spotify mediates access to music is undermining the potential for musical expertise to function as cultural capital. So let's unpack this statement a bit more. So firstly, when I talk about mediation, I'm referring to how music streaming services make music available, from how they present music to us when, they, when we log onto their apps, to the playlists and recommendations they create using data about who we are and what we like to listen to. And secondly, let's discuss this concept of cultural capital and how it relates to class reproduction. In order to do this, I need to briefly discuss my approach to class analysis and the theoretical and conceptual framework I used. So I adopt what sociologists call a culturalist approach to class analysis. So rather than exclusively relying on economic indicators as markers of class background and class divisions, this approach sees culture, lifestyle and taste to be integral to how class organises social life. This approach sees class identity manifesting implicit, individual and routine ways through practices such as music consumption. Like many culturalist approaches, I draw on Pierre Bourdieu's conceptual and theoretical framework. So Bourdieu uses the concept of habitus to explain how class background shapes our cultural practices. You can think of habitus as the lens or framework through which we see and act in the world. And Bourdieu uses this, this concept and argues that this lens is a product of our class upbringing. So this framework is built from the ideas, experiences and values we are exposed to growing up as members of the working, middle or upper classes. According to Bourdieu, our position in class society, so I, whether we're working middle or upper class, is an outcome of the volume and composition of economic, social and cultural capital we have access to. So economic capital refers to financial assets, social capital refers to personal networks and connections, and cultural capital refers to resources such as education, language and good taste. Crucially, for something to function as capital, it must be convertible into some kind of social advantage. For example, education helping you get a good job. In Borgia's terminology, the dominant classes, think middle or upper class, are those with high levels of economic, cultural and or social capital. So to return to my main point, I argue that using Spotify is undermining the potential for musical expertise to function as cultural capital for the dominant classes. I argue that this is because the ways in which the platform is mediating access to music, meaning how it makes music available, is closing down opportunities for individuals to display their taste and familiarity with music, by implication, limiting the opportunities to convert this expertise into social advantage, thereby limiting its, limiting its potential to function as capital. So the findings I'm presenting to you today are based on 20 semi-stripped interviews I conducted with individuals from different class backgrounds. My data collection analysis used a narrative approach which aimed to explore the development of my participants' biographies over time and how using streaming has shaped their relationship with music. My data collection focused specifically on the use of Spotify, the leading service in the UK. The data collection was conducted as part of a larger study involving interviews with both industry key informants and users of Spotify. So alongside the, use, the study of consumption, my res research is explored in great detail what, why and how Spotify mediates access to music, highlighting the importance of new forms of data-driven mediation, uh, what, the kind of things Rob's been talking about. So today I'm going to focus on consumption practices, but feel free to ask me more about the other aspects of my research at the end of this presentation. I'm going to limit myself to two contrasting vignettes about how using Spotify is shaping how two individuals, Jamie and Sean, perform class identity through the consumption of music. 
So let's begin with the story of Jamie. Jamie is in his early 20s and works in social media and marketing. Jamie was born in the UK, but has lived in a number of countries around the world because of his father's high-ranking occupation in the oil industry. And he studied philosophy at university in the UK. So Jamie's habitus, i.e. the lens through which he interacts with music, is characterised by an intellectualised engagement with music and an appreciation for music as an end in of itself. For example, creating playlists on Spotify is a way for him to demonstrate his taste and affirm his status as a music expert, as his comments illustrate. Jamie's habitus is a product of his upbringing in a cultural capital rich middle class family, where emphasis was placed on the value of cultural familiarity and competence. For example, Jamie and his father share an appreciation for music as an end in of itself. They often debate about what counts as good taste, and they both agree that music should possess artistic merit, which they describe as music which explores new ideas and has creative purpose. The way in which Spotify mediates access to music comes into contention with Jamie's habitus. Jamie harbours some resentment towards Spotify because of the way in which the service undermines the consumption of music as an end in of itself. Jamie feels that the continuous servicing of music through features such as Discover Weekly, a playlist of new music which refreshes on a weekly basis, undermines the value of music because he's spending less time appreciating what is made available to him by Spotify, which is in contention with his habitus. Moreover, Spotify is resented by Jamie because it undermines the musical expertise he possesses. Jamie describes the act of discovery as being consigned to the scrap heap because it is now automated by Spotify's recommendation systems. Whilst this is advantageous because the rate and scale at which Jamie can discover has increased, it also generates concern that he's being musically pigeonholed rather than broadening his horizons, which is a defining part of how he relates to music, as he explains. So Jamie's story highlights one way in which using Spotify is shaping how class identity is performed through the consumption of music. In this case, the way in which Spotify mediates access to music is limiting the opportunities for Jamie to appreciate music as an end in of itself and exercise his musical expertise, thereby undermining the potential for Jamie to reap the rewards from the cultural capital he has access to, thanks to his upbringing in a middle class family. So the second narrative I'd like to discuss is the story of Sean, one of my working class participants. Sean is in her early 20s and works as a receptionist. She left school at 16 and went straight into the workforce. In contrast to Jamie, Sean's habitus is characterised by an appreciation for music as a means to an end. Music is appreciated on the basis of how well it services particular situations, activities and moods, as Sean explains. These differences in habitus can be seen as a product of the different conditions of existence which Sean and Jamie's habituses were cultivated. Sean grew up in a working class household where her mother was a cleaner and her father was a kitchen porter. Whilst music was also omnipresent in the home, consumption was about emotional and sentimental value, unlike Jamie's family who used it as an opportunity to exercise their familiarity with the signs and symbols of good taste. Again, in contrast to Jamie, Sean is not resentful about the way in which music is mediated to her by Spotify. Sean embraces the promise <coughs> of streaming and is celebratory about the way the platform is able to service situations with music and help her to discover more of what she likes and is familiar with. However, this does not mean that Sean is a cultural dupe. There is still an expectation that the content being served to her is compatible with her habitus and by extension her class background. Sean does not take Spotify's curated content at face value. Rather, she critically engages with it to determine whether the content is right for her before choosing something to listen to, as she explains. So Sean's story offers a contrasting account of how using Spotify is shaping the performance of class identity. The way in which Spotify mediates access to music does not come into conflict with Sean's habitus in the same way it does for Jamie. As music consumption is less of an intellectual exercise, the stakes are different for Sean. She appreciates Spotify's ability to matchmake music with the activities, situations and moods in which she consumes music. So in summary, the stories of Jamie and Sean demonstrate to us some of the ways using Spotify is shaping the social dynamics of consumption. Jamie's narrative highlights to us how the way in which Spotify mediates access to music is closing down opportunities to deploy and convert cultural capital, whereas for Sean, the stakes are different because the consumption of music is not implicated in deployment and accumulation of cultural capital in the same way. These findings are significant because they highlight to us how Spotify is challenging existing accounts about how music taste and consumption are implicated in the reproduction of class divisions. From a culturalist and Bordeauxian perspective on class, the accumulation and deployment of cultural capital is fundamental to how class divisions are reproduced, as it is a means through which the dominant classes can maintain their dominance through access to assets such as education, cultural competence, and legitimate taste. 
However, the ways in which music streaming services media access to music invite us to consider a, uh, our understanding of how cultural capital is accumulated and deployed in the digital age. This is not to suggest that class no longer matters, rather we need to continue to examine how processes of class reproduction are adapting to the changing ways cultural goods are made available to us by platforms such as music streaming services. Thank you. Okay, so we've got like five minutes or so for questions. Um, would anyone like to start us off? You. Yeah, uh, you Spotify boys. Um, <laughs> do you guys pay attention to Neeland, or do you know about Neeland, the algorithm? Yeah, I'm curious about how you see them. They like created Discover Weekly algorithm, right? And the Daily Mixes algorithm, supposedly. How do you, how do you see what they want? What do they as a company want? And what do those algorithms want? Yeah, I think um, maybe the biggest challenge for Spotify is to mediate what they want and uh, mediate what users want and mediate what musicians want. And they're kind of playing this cat and mouse game trying to make everyone happy. But um, I'm not sure. I think that's something they're figuring out, especially as they go public. Um, but I don't know, honestly. What, what do you, I guess, what is does what the daily mix algorithm want or what does Discover Weekly want out of us as consumers? It just wants us to spend as much time on, on our Discover Weekly plays as possible, I think. Okay. Uh, Margo, what were some of the things you learned from the elderly people using Alexa? I know my grandmother can't really see an iPad or an iPhone, like her eyesight's not good enough, so she loves the voice interface. What kind of things did you find? Sure. Um, what things that I learned by interviewing the um, individuals live in the elderly retirement home. Um, so um, I, the first thing I'd say is I, I was a little bit surprised for, um, by how like tech savvy they were and how like there was so many um, like how, how these people use the device in the, in the same way. Right. Or would interact in the same way or had the same kind of like um, Something I'm looking at is like how transparent or opaque is the back end to, to, to owners. And so like, you know, this 95 year old woman sometimes like, oh yeah, the engineers are programming it to do this or like some script writer, you know, and at Amazon just makes these bad jokes. They're like super aware, right? Um, but also I think it's a um, really self-selected group of people that chose to speak with me. So there was that kind of bias playing in. Um, something that was really interesting, so I like learning those kind of things was, right, was that it wasn't as much of a comparative study as I thought it was gonna be. Um, but it was kind of uh, the unique use cases, like you're saying. So um, uh, one of the women had had low vision. So I think like a, a lot of these people, I also, I also work with someone at, at Cornell Tech who looks at like, um, uh, who also has low vision. And so we're kind of looking at how these devices can be used for these, these different communities. Um, and there was someone at the retirement home who uh, had low vision and couldn't hear that well, but had the device read the Bible to her every day. Um, and and with the Alexa voice, not with some other app thing, um, but also um, kept on ar arguing about whether or not it was a female or male voice. So really it was hard of hearing, but was still really commit, you know, was still really interested and committed to using the device. So um, just kind of the, it, it, uh, to some extent, the, the level really of uh, just having the device present or around the level of not true companionship these people got, but just kind of like saying good morning, having routines based around it, it being there was was more prevalent in with those interviews. Again, four, so sample size n equals four, so small, but um, compared to kind of the younger 20s and 30-year-old people that I spoke with. I think you mentioned about how Alexa would kind of interrupt in your interviews when it heard its own name. It's pretty fascinating. I wonder if you had any, any findings specifically around how people talk about the devices rather than necessarily to them. Because there's kind of way in which they interrupt conversations about themselves. It kind of disrupts your ability to criticize them. I guess is there anything, like, anything you found out about Totally. So I haven't focused on that, but it is there is a ton of data about it. Um, so like it, the way these uh, symbolic interactionists or micro sociologists talk about it is like barging in. So, you know, that really interrupts. Um, and people did talk a lot about the ways that they, when they're in group settings, will um, 
you know, kind of like whisper or like serve just like, you know, like we're talking about, like I'm talking about Amazon and like, I'll say it quietly. So I don't say the name or something. So it pops in. Um, so that stuff, again, like all this stuff's on a spectrum of kind of how hyper aware people are of, of the device. So here it's like, I don't want Amazon, like surveillance is so far on the other side of the spectrum. I almost put a pin in it for this study. Right. Um, cause people are super aware of not wanting some stuff being heard. Um, but something, um, that was interesting there uh, for interrupting is um, I don't think right now we're at a place tech, like from a technical perspective, but um, there's a huge question of whether or not we should be able to interrupt the device or the device should be able to interrupt us, right? Um, going like tying in this whole question of gender and assertiveness, um, like um, along with personality, not only what it says and how it says it, right? The cadence in which it says things, but also kind of like uh, with turn taking and stuff, that's also another um, way of, of there, you know, there's uh, gender and power dynamics and kind of how we even just have conversations. And so barging in is something that I might go back when I'm finished with kind of this research and kind of dig into. I'm sure, I'm sure there's way more interesting stuff in there than even just this. Yeah. Question for Jack. Um, do people like Jamie who are grumpy at music streaming services, how, like, do they buy vinyl, basically? Like, is that how they prove that they're cool, given that music service can't do that for them? Yeah, so there's more to Jamie, and, <laughs> and you, kind of, you kind of touched on it there. Um, so in the kind of other parts of my thesis, I talk about how using music streaming is also encouraging uh, other ways of consuming music as a response to the immateriality and ephemerality of consuming music on Spotify. So that resentment that Jamie has about the speed and rate at which music made available to him, in contrast, consuming music on vinyl is kind of like the slow consumption of music. It's slower, it's more deliberate, you create time and space. So for him, who music, for whom music is a big part of his identity and is kind of how he articulates his cultural capital, Vinyl consumption as, as, is a thing for him, um, but not for not necessarily for everybody. But that, that definitely came out as a, as a kind of a way of resisting how Spotify makes music available. You can slow it down; it's more material, that kind of thing. All right, um, will you all stick around? If you have any questions, they'll be here and they'll be around. So feel free to come on up. Thank you all so much for your amazing words on interactions and an audio landscape. It was really great to hear all of your musings. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming.